We have with us today Dr. Andrew Morrison. He's coming from us from uh, Joliet Junior College. And he, just to give you a little bit of background, he got his uh, bachelor's from uh, University of Northern Iowa. And he's got a minor, I believe, in, in Russian. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, OK. And uh, from there, he uh, did some grad school and got his PhD at Northern, uh, Northern Illinois University under the direction of uh, Dr. Thomas Rossing, if I'm not mistaken. And so um, his, he's been teaching recently at DePaul and Northwestern and Illinois Wesleyan. And he's here to talk to us today about the physics of music. So with no further ado, I'd like to present to you Dr. Andrew Morrison. Thanks so much. It's so great to see uh, so many people turn out for uh, a talk on physics at 4 o'clock on a Thursday. Um, most uh, students that, when I was a student, um, 4 o'clock on a Thursday was not physics time. Uh, can I ask uh, how many of you are musicians of, of any type? Great. Excellent. So. Um, in no means do you need to know anything about music or how to play a musical instrument, um, but it, it would help for purposes of this talk if you have some interest in music. If you like music, that's enough. Um, I, am, I am not a musician. Um, I grew up and, and went to, when I was going to school, I played musical instruments in, in school and I took a lot of uh, music lessons, but uh, by the time I graduated high school, it was apparent to me that um, I was not working hard enough on my practicing, and so uh, I decided I needed to go into physics uh, instead. So, so uh, the question I like to start with when I talk about um, the physics of music and how we understand uh, how musical instruments behave is how are sounds generated just in general? And it turns out when, I, when, when a physicist looks at a, a musical instrument, uh, we can break that musical instrument down into three basic parts. Uh, and really, at least one of them is optional. Uh, the basic parts are there has to be some sort of oscillating mechanism. There has to be a vibration of some sort. Every single musical instrument has a oscillating generator uh, of some type. On the guitar pictured here, it's the string. The string is vibrating. Uh, but the problem with that, that string working by itself is that it's not able to push enough air to radiate the sound from the string out into the audience. So the second part for every musical instrument is there has to be some sort of radiating mechanism. There has to be something that takes the, the sound that's produced by the oscillator and amplifies it out into, and so it can uh, project out into the audience. The, the third thing that uh, most musical instruments have, not, not all, is uh, some way to control the pitch. You want to change the notes and uh, you know, you'll have a, a musical instrument. Of course, not all musical instruments have them. Um, Notable exceptions that where you can't control the pitch are things like drums, right? Uh, but this is the, the, the basic layout of our, uh, our musical instrument. So I want to start talking about the oscillator. That's the first thing I want to talk about. And uh, the simplest oscillator that we can think about when we think about a physical system is a, a spring and a mass. So here I have animated a spring, or sorry, two springs and one mass, but you know, I could make it simpler if I got rid of one of the, if I get rid of the one of the springs. So get rid of one of the springs, I have um, a spring and a mass, and it just oscillates back and forth. And believe it or not, with this very simple system, we could spend the whole hour, we could spend this next week, this next month, just talking about this system. Uh, I'm not going to do that. But, but there is a lot that we can learn from that. Um, for example, if you have the, the spring and the mass, you really only have two parameters to control. You have the spring and you have the, the mass. The spring, its parameter is how springy is it. Some springs are, are stiffer than others and they're more springy. And then the mass, the property of the mass is how massive is it. Right? So if we have a mass and uh, we set the spring in motion, we can measure the time that it takes for that motion to repeat. 
That's what we call the period. Or we could say, well, um, we know the period, but how frequently does that, does that motion repeat? And that's what we call the frequency. And that's the important thing that we can measure of the spring mass system. So if we change one of the properties of the spring mass system, how do those things that we measure change? Well, if I, if I put more mass onto the, onto the spring, it turns out that the frequency of this system gets lower. That is, uh, it takes longer. The period increases. It takes longer for that to repeat. And that's something that uh, we see in musical instruments all over the place. Uh, a lower frequency corresponds to a lower pitch. So in general, the larger the instrument, the lower the pitch of that instrument is. Think of the difference between a flute and a piccolo. Now, they're both small instruments, but the smaller one is higher. It has less mass, higher pitch. Or the difference between a, a trumpet and a tuba. It's the same idea. So this is our, our simplest system that we can talk about. Uh, but what happens if we make it just a little bit more complicated? Oh, yeah. We can make it a little bit more complicated by adding another mass and another spring. So now we have two masses and two springs. Now, I'll say that if I jump back to, to this really quick, we can stare at this until the end of time, and this is what this system will do. It'll just go back and forth. We can try all sorts of different tests, and this is the only type of motion that this spring mass system is going to exhibit, assuming that we're limiting our uh, the, the direction of travel to that one horizontal dimension. But notice that when you add that second mass, now you introduce another possibility for the way that that system of two masses and three springs can move. The top, uh, the, the, the top animation that, that we're seeing, the, that motion, is very similar to the motion that we saw on the previous example where both masses are moving together. All right. uh, the bottom one, the masses are moving opposite each other. But what you should also notice is that not only are those motions different, but the time that it takes for that motion to repeat, which is the period, is also different. The bottom one is faster than the top one. So the bottom one has a, a higher frequency than that top one. We could add uh, yet another mass and another spring, and we get the same, uh, we, we get a, a similar behavior. The top, they're all moving together. And uh, in the bottom, they're all moving opposite their neighbor. And in the middle, the two outer ones are moving opposite, and the middle one is stationary. So it turns out that we don't have, I don't have too much time to talk about this, but it turns out that. If you look at this, what is controlling the number of ways in which the system can move, which is what we call a mode of vibration or a mode of oscillation, is the number of masses. The number of springs has nothing to do with the number of ways in which the system can uniquely move. We could add additional springs on, and as long as we keep the masses the same and we restrict our motion to that horizontal direction, then the number of ways in which it moves is going to be the same. I also want to point out that uh, this mass here that's, that's moving right there, that's the first example of what we call a, a node of vibration. So if I, if I had that, that system set up in a lab somewhere or um, uh, in this room, wherever, I could touch that middle mass and the two other masses would not be affected. They would still be moving. So a node is a, a minimum point of, of vibration. Of course, um, we could keep adding masses and keep adding masses, and eventually we'd have to make those masses a lot smaller and the springs a lot smaller. But eventually you'd go from something that you have a bunch of connected masses into something that's more continuous, like the string that we were talking about before. Um, it, it, uh, I think that the, the point is, is made, though, with just the, three, just the three masses. 
So then we come to the next part of the instrument, which is how does sound travel? How does it get from the place where it's generated to the place where it's observed? Uh, and that's how we really distinguish whether or not a sound is a sound, right? You guys ever hear that, that old question or anybody ever ask you if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Remember hearing that? Yeah. Well, if sound requires both the generation of that sound and the detection, the observation, then of course a tree falling in the forest doesn't make a sound because if no one's there to hear it, then well, it, it might as well never happen. But the question is, how, do, how does sound travel? How does it get from that place where it started to the place where someone hears it? And at, hopefully you can see from the, the background, I'm sort of alluding to this idea, and maybe most of you are thinking, oh, sound, I've heard sound travels as a wave, right? Okay. So sound travels as a wave, but what is a wave? What's the mental picture that you have in your head of what a sound wave is, or any wave in general? Are you thinking this? This is a good thought to have on a February day in <laughs> Illinois. Or are you thinking this? I mean, this is a physics talk after all. Isn't this what a, a wave looks like in, in a physics lab? <laughs> These pictures are, are useful, but we need to talk about what a wave really is. So a wave is a disturbance in, in a medium. It doesn't really matter what that medium is. That's why we can talk about light as a wave, sound as a wave, water waves. We talk about the wave at the, uh, at the ballpark. We could do the wave right here. I wasn't expecting this many people. I would have prepared us to do a wave. <clears throat> But it's a disturbance in, in a medium which transports energy through the medium. That's the key. The energy is transported through the medium, but the medium itself doesn't go anywhere. So if you think about throwing a rock into a, a lake and you see the water ripple away, the little, the little drops of water that are rippling, they're not actually going very far at all. Just like sound is traveling as a wave through the air in this room. All of you, I hope, can hear me, right? But all of you, I hope, are not feeling the breath that is coming out of my mouth, <laughs> right? The medium through which the wave is traveling is not going from me to you, but yet the energy that I'm creating is going from me to you. And that's the essence of what a wave really is. So then if we want to picture what a sound wave looks like, this is a, this is a sound wave that I've, uh, I have an animation of where the, there's just a little pulse that's traveling down a pipe, you can imagine. And all those little dots represent particles of air. And so the particles of air, they bump into each other, and they, then they bump into their neighbors, and that, that pulse propagates down the pipe. But the molecules themselves don't really move all that far from where they started. So this type of wave, where the disturbance travels in the same direction that the actual energy travels, this is what we call a longitudinal wave. Sound is a longitudinal wave. This is an example of a, a representation of a sound wave. And it turns out for us to be able to visualize sound waves longitudinally is relatively difficult. We don't like to do it. It's, it's hard to keep track of all these particles and think of, well, the, the particles are compressing together and then there's a rarefaction. That's where the particles decompress. So you go from high pressure regions to low pressure regions and that becomes hard hard to visualize this way so we we like to use a different representation which is related to the other type of wave the other type of wave that you may be more familiar with is a transverse wave in a transverse wave the uh, disturbance is perpendicular to the direction that the energy is going now, sound is not a transverse wave, but sometimes 
we represent sound by making a graph of the pressure. And we say, well, if the pressure is high, that's where the molecules are compressed together, we can represent that as a high point in the graph, and then that's a lot easier for us to visualize. So that's what I'm going to do uh, for the rest of the slides here. So they're not exactly synced up here, but if you think about the, the bottom graph as a graph of the profile of the pressure, then we can use that bottom graph to represent the sound wave, even though sound is not a transverse wave. It is, in fact, a longitudinal wave. So uh, these are examples of what we call traveling waves. The sound of my voice that is coming from me out to you, that's also a traveling wave. It travels from me out into the, out into the room and uh, is eventually absorbed by uh, the air and the walls and, and everything around us. But a travel and a traveling wave will just go on until the energy is absorbed by, by something out there. Uh, I would represent this pulse as going on uh, to infinity, but uh, the screen really isn't that long. <laughs> we could, with that simple pulse, we could measure the speed of the wave. All right, we could say if I know how how far it is from one point to another, I could stand with a stopwatch and just measure. How far has it gone in a certain amount of time? And I can know the speed of that wave. So that's something that I can measure. And it turns out that the speed of a wave is a property of whatever medium the wave is traveling through. So if I change the medium, I can change the speed of the wave. If I put a bunch of pulses together, I can end up with a uh, a, a traveling wave that is a series of pulses. And we can look at that traveling wave that looks more like a wave like you might have seen or, or visualized before uh, in two different ways. The first way is um, if you make a graph of the amplitude of the wave at one very specific point, at the point of that red dot, we'll just graph what it is through time. So there's nothing until the wave hits it, then it oscillates, and so we can graph that. And from this graph, we can get a measurement of the period of the wave. Just like the spring mass system had a period, so too does the wave have a period. It's the amount of time that it takes the wave to repeat at one particular spot in space. On the other hand, if we stood back and we looked at one very specific spot, um, or not one very, one, very specific, one very specific time, and we said, okay, at this very specific time, we're going to take a, a picture of the whole thing. So at a, at a very specific time, in this case, it was 27 seconds, whatever that means. At 27 seconds, we're going to take a picture, and boom, at that instant, that's what it looks like. So here you have a graph of position versus amplitude, and from that you can measure the wavelength. Now each of those look very similar, but they're actually telling us two different things. One is how long is the wave, the other is uh, what is the frequency or period of the wave. But the frequency and period are both related to the wave speed, and it's, it's a basic relation that if you make use of, you can actually uh, use it to design musical instruments. So if I take two traveling waves and I send them together in the same medium in opposite directions, they'll interfere with each other. Their amplitudes add up. In this case, I have both of the waves pointing up. So as they come through, the amplitude is just the sum of the two individual amplitudes, and they go, they go up together, they combine. We're going to make use of this, though, because I want to send two waves with lots of pulses in opposite directions of each other. One thing, well, another thing I can do is look at what happens to a wave pulse if it interferes or hits a boundary. So a wave comes in, strikes a boundary, reflects, and goes opposite of the way it came in. 
Now it turns out that uh, the way a wave behaves when it hits a boundary depends upon how that boundary is, is set up. Is the boundary a hard boundary? Is the boundary a soft boundary? We could, instead of having this, if you imagine this as maybe a string that's tied to a, um, a, a pole, we could replace the knot that's tying that string to the pole. You could replace it with a little hoop. And that hoop could be free to slide up and down the pole. And so in that case, we would not have a hard boundary, but we'd have a free boundary. And the wave would still reflect off of that free boundary, but the way it would reflect would be um, different than this in that it would not flip from up to down. It would stay up. So I'm going to combine this with what I was talking about before in, in, in one more slide. So here's our two waves coming in opposite directions. And at the bottom, I'm graphing the combination of those two. So as they pass through each other, these two waves have the same frequency, they have the same wave speed, they have the same wavelength. They combine together, and these two traveling waves, the wave in blue, the wave in red, are both traveling waves. As they combine, the combination of those two is a wave that, after it develops, it appears to just stay stationary. And a wave that stays stationary like that is what we call a standing wave. So a standing wave is an example of a resonance, a, a resonance of a, a type of uh, physical system. So those resonances are hugely important for figuring out how an instrument is going to produce the notes that it's going to produce. If you know what the resonances of a trumpet are, then you know all the notes that you can play on that trumpet. You don't know how it's going to sound, but you do know all the notes that are available for it. If you know the resonances of a string, you're going to know all the, the uh, notes that you could, well, if you know the resonances of a string, you're going to know more about how something like a guitar or a, um, a violin will sound. But what becomes important, and this is one of my key, key messages for you today, is that boundary conditions determine the resonances. So if the resonances are what determine how an instrument sounds, then the boundary conditions are going to determine uh, how those resonances are going to behave. And there's a couple uh, simple rules that you can make use of in order to, to figure out what... Um, what boundary conditions will be important for your instruments. If you have a string instrument, the strings tend to be fixed at the bridge and at the nut. So the strings at the boundaries are not free to vibrate. They're tied to the nut, they're tied to the bridge. Not literally, but the bridge and the, and the nut are restricting their motion. So those are fixed boundaries on the stringed instruments. Pipes, on the other hand, which is what we use to model things like clarinets, saxophones, trumpets, trombones, all the wind instruments, pipes can be either open at both ends or they can be open at one end and closed at the other end. In principle, a pipe can be closed at both ends, but that makes for a very quiet musical instrument. Mm -hmm. right. So. The boundary conditions for an open pipe is that the node is, uh, or sorry, the, the end of the open pipe is a pressure node. All right. So uh, that kind of makes sense because at the open end, there's nothing to restrict the air from building up higher pressure. So that the pressure at the end of an open pipe has to match atmospheric pressure. So it has to be a pressure node. There's nothing to cause the pressure to go higher at the open end, which means that the closed end of a pipe must be a pressure antinode. If you send a pulse of uh, sound down the end of a closed pipe, when that pulse gets to the end, all the air molecules are going to be packing up against the end, and then 
after they packed up, they're going to push off against the end and come back out and leave a pressure minimum. If we look at plates, two-dimensional surfaces, things like guitar soundboards or uh, drum heads, anything that's, that's flat like that, plates can be either fixed or free at their boundaries. I have a few examples of those, although it turns out that after we go away from, from strings and pipes, actually, other than, than using the, the, um, the, the observation that plates can be fixed or free, it turns out that plates become very complicated to be able to predict um, how they're going to behave. It, it can be done, but it's, um, it's relatively uh, math intensive. Uh, so to find the lowest resonance of a string, what I always do is I look at just an arbitrary wave. I'm looking at this and I'm saying, well, suppose that this was a wave and I wanted to fit this wave so that there's a standing wave on my guitar, on my guitar string. And I know that my rule was that at the boundary there have to be nodes. And the nodes are these points here where it crosses that equilibrium position. And if this was a standing wave, I could grab that point and it wouldn't affect the wave at all. Just like it didn't affect that mass at the beginning, grabbing a node doesn't affect this, this at all. So I want to find the closest two points that have nodes at either end. Well, those two work as good as any. So I'll just say that this length from here to here, that represents the length of the string on my guitar. Then if, I, then if I say to myself, well, okay, if that's true, then how many waves do I have in this position from here to here? Well, from here all the way over to here, that's one whole wave. So then from here to here, that must be one half of a wave. And if that's one half of a wave, then I know that this length is equal to one half of a wave, so the wavelength must be equal to two times the length of my string on my guitar. And if I know the relation between the frequency and the wavelength and the wave speed, the speed of the wave on the string, I can figure out what the frequency of my guitar string is going to be. Is there going to be a quiz at the end of this? Yes. There's? Okay, good. Uh, I'm leaving out the, the, the details of the math um, because uh, you know, I know that, that every time I put an equation on, on the slide, somebody leaves the room. So, but it turns out that using those rules, I can predict the first three resonances of the string. And it turns out that if I apply the relation between the frequency, the wavelength, and the wave speed, that whatever my lowest frequency of that string is going to be, the second frequency is going to be twice as, as high. The third one is going to be uh, three times as high. The fourth one will be four times the first. The fifth is five times, and so on and so forth. It makes a really, really nice pattern. Using the relations and the boundary conditions for the, the pipes, I can look at a pipe that's open at both ends, and it turns out that the waves follow a very similar behavior as the strings do. Now, of course, these are graphs of pressure at one instant in time. At an at a instant later, after this graph is made, the pressure curve will be a little bit lower. And an instant later, it's going to be even lower. And, it'll, and eventually, it'll come down and follow a curve that is opposite what this is. Right? But we represent an instant in time where the pressure has reached a maximum. And that maximum is, is what we call an antinode. So a node, remember these are our nodes. This point was a node. The boundaries were, were nodes. The maximum is an antinode. And again, we have the relationship, the lowest, which is what we call the fundamental. The fundamental is the, the lowest frequency then the second resonance is twice the fundamental, the third resonance is three times the fundamental, so on and so forth. If I look at the first three resonances of a closed pipe, 
then the pattern looks a little bit different. And I should have put on uh, which end was the closed pipe, but the side with the antinode, the pressure antinode, is the closed end. The side that's open is the pressure node. And so what we see is instead of a series of um, the fundamental and then the next one is two times the fundamental and the third one is three times the fundamental, what we see are all those even integer multiples of the lowest of that fundamental frequency, they're all missing. And all we get are the odd, the odd multiples of the fundamental. So the boundary conditions, they apply to the plates. Um, here's an example on, on the left of where the top plate of a violin is fixed. The ribs are holding it in place. Only at the end, the, the middle is um, free to vibrate. And um, the symbol is an example of where the, the outer boundaries are free to vibrate, but the middle is fixed. Now, this one I can't tell if it's actually um, been tightened down or if it's just sort of hanging on there. Uh, but in general, uh, this is going to act, the center point is going to act as a node, and the outer part of the symbol is going to act as an antinode because it's free to vibrate. All right, so with all those, those basic rules in play, the question that we, sh that we really want to get into is, why do instruments sound the way they do? Well, let's listen to, to three notes. I tested this um, before, so it's guaranteed not to work. All right, here's three notes. All right, you'll forgive my uh, speakers. They're not the highest quality. But you could ask a question, uh, what can you say about those notes? We could also forgive the performer. I don't know um, his or her skill. Uh, what observations can we make about the sound that you hear in those notes? Uh, I'm not, I don't have perfect pitch. But to me, they sound like they were playing the same note, the same note on the, on the musical scale. And um, we, could, we could listen to it again and, and uh, try to judge it. But I think that the performers were all trying to play at the same amplitude, right? But clearly, those were three different instruments, right? Even forgiving the, the quality of the speakers, I think you could distinguish the, the three instruments. Anybody? Hazard a guess on what the instruments were? Violin, violin, trumpet, and piano. Yeah, right. So, violin, trumpet, piano. Okay, very good. So, and what I have here are the waveforms of those uh, notes that were being played. Again, the amplitude of the pressure versus time. And they're all, it's all um, smashed together. I could spread it out and we could try to analyze it and learn a lot about the sounds just by analyzing the, the waveforms. However, it's a really tedious process to do that and it, it becomes um, not fun very quickly. A different way of looking at the note is to have a computer do an analysis where instead of plotting the amplitude on the y-axis and time, we plot the frequency on the horizontal axis and the amplitude on the vertical axis. And if you look at, I only plotted here the violin and the trumpet, but we can see that there's similarities and differences that are very readily apparent. The violin has a a series of these peaks starting at this lowest frequency. That, low, that lowest frequency is what we call the fundamental frequency, like I mentioned before. And it seems as if the peaks that are higher in frequency are all regularly spaced. And when they're regularly spaced like that, 
when the second peak is two times the frequency of the, of the fundamental and the third is three times the frequency of the fundamental, we call those harmonics. They're harmonically related. Now, not all sounds that have multiple peaks in their spectrum are harmonically related. If they have peaks but they're not harmonically related, we refer to those as, as partials. All right? So partials or harmonics are partials, but not all partials are harmonic. And if you look at the trumpet, the trumpet that was played uh, also had regularly spaced harmonic frequencies in its spectrum. And indeed, the, the frequency of the, the lowest, uh, the frequency of the fundamental in each case was the same frequency, or very close. So the performers uh, were playing the same note. But there are differences in the spectrum that relate to how we can identify what that instrument is. For example, a characteristic of brass instruments is that the fundamental, the amplitude of the fundamental peak is usually not the highest amplitude peak. It's not the strongest. More energy is actually in the middle part of the spectrum than in the lowest part. But in a violin or a piano or in many, many other instruments, usually most of the energy is in the, 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 the lowest part of the spectrum, and most of it is often in the fundamental. Also, we can see that there's a difference in the width of those individual peaks. The violin has slightly wider peaks. The trumpet has very narrow, very distinct peaks. So spectrum is hugely related to this quality of music that we call timbre. And timbre is your ability to distinguish two sounds that are similar in pitch, similar in amplitude, from each other. Now, spectrum is not the only thing that defines timbre, but it's hugely related to it. For example, uh, if we go back to the waveform, the uh, attack and decay also play a big part in our ability to distinguish instruments from each other. All right, so how do these instruments actually make the sound? Well, if you're, uh, if you're, if you're a wind player, uh, I'm going to uh, play favorites and, and only talk about the brass instruments uh, because uh, I, I, I played trombone in, in uh, college and high school. Uh, and I apologize to the, uh, to the reed players. Uh, but a lot of the physics for woodwinds is very similar to the physics for the, the brass instruments. So uh, remember, the two parts that we need are the, the sound oscillation source and the radiation. So the oscillation for a brass instrument is given, is provided by the lips, which vibrate very rapidly in order to get the sound into the instrument. So a player who will buzz into the mouthpiece. Uh, I haven't buzzed. Something like that. Um, the the uh, puffs of air that come out uh, are what set up that oscillation. But as those puffs are propagated down the length of the instrument, they're reflected at the end, and the energy that comes back helps to allow that player to have the lips open at the correct time to get the sound out that, um, to continue that buzzing. So this is a, um, a feedback mechanism that the instrument provides to help keep that process going. But the lips just opening and closing by themselves, if all they were doing was opening and closing at that frequency of the note that you're trying to play, that's the only thing that they were doing, all you would get was, would be a sine wave, right? And it would be at that resonance of the tube, whatever it was, the resonance that we were talking about earlier. And that wouldn't, that wouldn't have the rich tone that we want from our brass instruments and our woodwind instruments. So where does the, the richness of the spectrum come from? Where do all those harmonics come from? Well, it turns out that 
uh, especially for brass instruments, it's really hard to play so softly that your lips open and close sinusoidally with only one frequency in the component. In fact, if you blow at a sort of a, a moderate level, your, the puffs of air are going to come out and they're going to look kind of like this where your lips end up being open a little bit more than they're closed. And as that returning reflected pulse comes back, your lips are quickly slammed shut, the pressure quickly builds up in your, in your mouth, and the lips open and they close and open and close, and it looks something either like this or like this. And this, these curves here are not sinusoidal and in fact have a lot of high frequency components in it which the instrument uh, through the design of the bell can radiate out into the, into the audience. All right. Um, for string instruments, the timbre depends on how you excite it. You can either pluck an instrument or you can bow the instrument. Or you could do something else. I don't know, but I go to, I go to shows and string players are always doing something crazy with sticks that I can never quite tell if it's plucking, bowing, hammering, what, it's, what they're doing with it. If you pluck the, the, um, you pluck the string, the position at which you pluck the string will affect the amplitude of all the resonances in, the, in that spectrum. So if I pluck at um, one half of the way down the length of the string, I end up getting rid of most of the even harmonics. If I pluck at one-fifth of the way down the string, which is where approximately a guitar will be plucked, then I end up getting rid of, or minimizing, at, at, at the very least, every fifth harmonic. So the fifth harmonic, the tenth harmonic, so on and so forth. And uh, there are some tuning issues that um, are actually helped by, by this uh, a little bit. Bowing is a very complicated process. Uh, the motion of the string is dictated by what we call the slip stick action that that bow is providing. So for a part of the, actually a, a large part of the cycle of the string, the bow is actually stuck to the string and is guiding that string along and eventually the string stretches so much that it can no, the, the bow can no longer keep hold of it and it slips off and snaps back where the bow catches it and the process repeats. So that is a, a huge part of um, what leads to the distinct timbre of a bowed string as opposed to a um, as opposed to a plucked string. Now, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't do a physics talk without throwing in a circuit for all the physicists in here. Um, it looks like your homework? Oh, very good. This is, well, there is a quiz after this. Excellent. Um, I'm not going to talk uh, too much of, about the circuit, but it turns out that the, the body of a string instrument is uh, very important, of course, to how the, the instrument works. Um, we like to model the, the instrument, the string instrument, as a series of coupled oscillators. So I talked earlier about how the string itself, um, the string itself doesn't radiate enough sound for anyone to hear it, right? So how does the vibrations from the sound get from the string out to you? Well, the string, when it's vibrating, it drives the bridge. So that part earlier where I said that the bridge is fixed and, and it can't move, that's just a little white lie. Mm -hmm. uh, physicists do that. Um, if, it, if the bridge couldn't move, then the energy couldn't get from the string to the bridge, and then from the bridge, the bridge is going to drive the top plate. So the bridge makes the top plate vibrate, and this top plate has much, much greater surface area than the string. So the top plate can push an incredible amount of air, right? As a, at least compared to the, to the string. And then the top plate is going to push the air that's inside the cavity, 
right? And if I, if I had an actual classical guitar and I was holding it and playing it like classical guitars would be, we'd talk about how the um, vibrations are coupled into the back plate. So you have lots of vibrations all coupled together and how this whole instrument works together is very, very complicated and very interesting to study. But I want to show you um, what I mean about the, the, uh, the top plate being able to push a lot more air. So I have a tuning fork, and um, those of you in the front row will probably be able to hear it. Those of you in the back row may be able to hear it, may not be able to hear it. All right? But um, I'm going to get you guys to help me just a little bit. All right, so. All right. Can you guys hear that back there? Can you hear it? Mm -hmm. You can hear it? You hear it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You hear it? Okay. All right. So you guys got to believe them that this is actually <laughs> going. All right. All right. So I'm going to hit it. Do a magic trick. So if I, put the, if I put the stem of this, this thing's now vibrating. Put the stem of this on here. Can you hear it back there? Can you hear it? A little bit? All right. So I'm going to try it again. All right. So this is acting to amplify that sound. Now, of course, um, this is a 320 hertz E, which I'm not sure how in tune it still is after being in a physics lab. But um, I'm going to hit this, and I'm going to put it right here on the chalkboard. You guys hear that? Yeah? OK, now let me ask you this. Um, what do you think the likelihood that the architects at the College of DuPage were thinking that, oh, yeah, uh, on February 23rd, we're going to need this thing to resonate at 320 hertz. I think they were thinking that, that whiteboard? Probably not. And so it turns out that this behavior where you know, the strings are driving all this other stuff, that's not a resonant behavior. That's what we call sympathetic vibrations. All right? This is vibrating, but it's not vibrating at its own natural frequency. Now, of course, the resonances of the top plate are very important. We want the instrument to be resonant, but we don't need to match the frequencies of the top plate to the frequencies that we want these to resonate at. All right, that's sympathetic vibration. And then um, probably the simplest instrument to understand um, in principle, are percussion instruments, which is something I'm very interested in. But it turns out that percussion instruments, although they look simple, I mean, think about it. You hit the instrument, it vibrates, and that sound goes out. What, what else is there to understand? Right? Whatever frequencies are in those instruments are going to, to get out. But here's an example of a percussion instrument that has um, all the pitches in it in, um, in the, full, the, the, the full instrument. Um, this is a layout of a tenor steel pan. Uh, some of you may call these steel drums, but uh, people that play them prefer to call them steel pan. They came from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, the particular one I, I've been looking at was tuned by a tuner from Trinidad, Trinidad named Bertie Kelman. And uh, for the musicians in the audience, it uses a layout that they call fourths and fifths, which is a traditional layout for, uh, for steel pan. Uh, steel pan, there's no fixed rules, but there are a lot of traditions. And what the fourths and fifths mean is that if you take any note, for example, the C, uh, the neighboring notes will be the musical fourth on one side and the musical fifth on the other side. Now, uh, a fifth um, for the non-musicians, has a frequency ratio of 3 to 2. Um, so the, the G is 1.5 times higher in frequency than the C. I use, I'm not going to talk about this, but I wanted to point out that uh, in order to study how the drum moves or how any of these instruments vibrate, we sometimes use optics uh, and a technique called electronic speckle pattern interferometry, which is a modern way of doing um, a type of holography. 
we set our, our, our drum out here. We have a laser that provides us light. And then um, by splitting the beam into two parts and then making the object vibrate, we can actually see the vibrations and record them. So the first three resonances of one note of the steel pan look a little bit like this. And you can read these, these images as if they were contour maps. There's a contour map um, at the outermost part where it's all white. There's no vibration. So anytime you see the bright white, it's a node. All right? And then every time you cross a lighter gray, the circles, uh, that's changing by about a quarter of the wavelength of the laser light. So I could measure the amplitude of the vibration if that was something I was interested in. Mostly, I'm interested in what is the shape of these modes, right? Remember we talked about the, the, the springs and masses all had unique ways that they vibrate? This, these are unique ways that the same note vibrates. And when I hit that note with my mallet, all of those vibrations are there. But I want to see them separately so that I can understand them. So this mode vibrates all in phase. This mode here, the two anti-node regions are out of phase with each other. So when one is coming out, the other one's coming in, back and forth, like that. The third mode, and the tuner, by the way, does, um, does his best to tune this so that those three modes are harmonic. But the third mode also has two anti-node regions, also out of phase with each other, but oriented 90 degrees uh, different with, with respect to that second mode. So what makes the steel pan unique? Well, what makes the steel pan unique is that all the notes are embedded in the same mass of metal. Think about all the other tuned percussion instruments, keyboard instruments like the xylophone or the uh, marimba, whatever. The notes that you're hitting are separate from one another. So if you hit one note on the xylophone, it's not going to transfer into the other notes. But the steel pan is different. You hit one note, the vibrations go over the whole pan. And so they'll make the other notes vibrate, especially since they're all connected by the frequencies. So this is the second harmonic of this note. This is, a, I think this is a, no, I think this is an A. I'll take it back. So this is a, this is an A, it was a little bit out of tune, but it was uh, about 880 hertz, something like that. Uh, and this is the fundamental of the octave, which is also at that same frequency. So when I hit this note out here, it makes this note vibrate with this pattern. But remember I said that there are the, the force and fist layout. So the force and fist are connected the third resonance of one note is the same as the, the same frequency as the second resonance of its neighbor, and that second resonance of the neighbor is the same as the first resonance of this octave. So all three of these notes are connected together. So I wanted to look at, at how, how do these waves propagate as I hit the, hit the, um, the pan. And uh, I had access to a high-speed camera that took pictures uh, at a frame rate of about 10,000 frames per second. So I was able to, uh, the, the camera was also hooked up to one of these electronic speckle pattern interferometers. And so we looked at how do the waves behave as, um, after we hit it. So here's a close-up of two notes that are, the, this is the A4 and the octave. So there's the strike. And then you'll see right over here, I don't know why that goes. Uh, you'll see right over here that octave is starting to emerge. So it turns out that even though you saw that wave 
that initial strike, the, the wave that, that went out, went really quickly outward because the speed of sound in the metal is so high, it took a relatively long time for the energy to get into the uh, resonance of that second note, that coupled note. So we believe that this discrepancy between the time that it takes the wave to start moving and the time for the energy to actually get into that resonance is hugely related to the unique sound of, that, of the steel pan, the timbre of the instrument itself. And this is something that we've been, we've been trying um, to measure for quite a long time. So here's the takeaway. It should always be a takeaway from a talk, right? Um, boundary conditions help us predict the resonances of musical instruments. There's a lot we don't know yet about the acoustics of, of music and musical instruments. We're always, we're always trying to understand better how these things work, and we have a lot of fun trying to figure it out. So I want to thank some people. I want to thank, first of all, the College DuPage for having me. I want to thank Dr. Tom Carter for inviting me. Uh, Joliet Junior College, my colleagues um, who I work with. And most of all, I want to thank you for your attention. We have, we have time for uh, a few questions. If there are any questions, uh, we can entertain a few. Any questions? Because I have a question. Okay. Uh, I was wondering, you said that the, the steel pan drum was tuned by hand. Right. How do, they, how do they tune that? How do they make it so that you get the fourth and the fifth and right. the octave? And so how do they tune the steel drum? It's actually a, 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 an iterative, well, do we have another hour? <laughs> it's, it's actually, um, it's, it's a multi-step process. After they sink that basic form down in, they start shaping out the notes. And once they've uh, outlined where the notes are going to be, um, it's a process of sort of stretching the metal to the right, to the right pitches. And to get the harmonics in tune to where they want them to be, um, you start with one note, and once you get it in tune, all the other notes are out of tune. So then you go to the next note, you get it in tune, and now the one that you had in tune is now out of tune. And so you have to, it's, you're always trying to bring them back closer in. And they use a lot of different um, ways of striking it to sort of, they use glancing blows to try to stretch the metal. Okay, so they're, they're not heating it or while there they're... There is heating that goes on as well. It's, it's, it's a very, very in-depth yeah, okay. process. Yeah, but there's heat treating that goes on. It can take, uh, it depends on the tuner, but it can take um, a, a, a week or a few weeks to, to tune a single drum. What about the Stradivarius makes it so expensive? That's a, that's a question that... The finest, yeah. So it turns out that there was a recent study that was just published where they got uh, expert musicians to do blind playing tests of Stradivarius. And um, if you ask the scientists, the result of the study was that the expert musicians could not tell the difference between a modern good instrument and a uh, classic Italian instrument, not only the, the Stradivarius, but some of his uh, contemporaries. Uh, and so um, there, part of what um, makes a Stradivarius so desired is, um, I guess, the belief that, that they really do sound good. And of course, they are fine instruments. Um, but there is no one sort of secret of what, what makes a Stradivarius good. Uh, the difference is that um, the, the, the old Italian masters, they, they took years to develop their craft and to, to craft those fine instruments, and really only the finest of their fine instruments survived. Um, when we study violins and things like that, uh, we are, are, are looking to see, well, what are the best practices for making a good instrument? And we hope that it doesn't take uh, a maker, you know, several generations to make a, a fine instrument. Um, but it's it's a it's a it's a puzzling question. I mean, it's, there's no real one answer for that. So I think that the musicians who were involved with the study, um, they have since since the study's been published, they have told their side of the story and have raised some uh, legitimate concerns about some of the conclusions. And um, I really think it's it's uh, um, scientists need to have continual dialogue with the musicians because. Um, I can have all the data in the world that 
tells you something about an instrument. But if you tell me I really like this instrument and here's why, well, who am I to argue with the musician who is providing us beautiful music on an instrument that they love? There has to be some truth in the musician's opinion, right? So, um, but the study um, was not necessarily uh, trying to, to say which instrument is better, the, the modern good instruments or the old Italian masters. The study was simply trying to say, if we have a truly blind test, can a player tell the difference? Because I guarantee you, um, I have a, a student violin that I bought at a thrift store out in my trunk, and if I, I, I can't make it sound good at all. But if I gave it to Joshua Bell, Joshua Bell would make it sing. And, and it's just a, a mass-produced thing came on a boat, you know? Uh, so there's a lot that the player can do, but the great violins, uh, it's a lot easier for the, the great violinists to, to make them sound good. Now, you also, also mentioned the varnish, and that's a, a very interesting question, which is a, a lot easier to test. And um, not only has the varnish been raised as a question, but what about um, the glue joints that have been raised? Um, I was at an acoustics conference a few years ago, and uh, one of our, my colleagues brought in a, the New York Times, and, and he talked about how there's a museum in Italy with the world's largest collection of Stradivarius violins. And that museum employs a person whose only job is to play the instruments in order to keep them in playing condition. And the idea is, the belief is, is that um, the, the instruments need to stay vibrating in order to keep their, their high quality. And I tell you what, if you talk to a scientist, when I heard this, I thought it was crazy. I mean, what does the cello care if it's been played you know, for months or been in the closet for months. I mean, now granted, things like humidity and, and um, climate control, very important. But uh, musicians that own fine instruments are fairly good at keeping very good care of their instruments. So if we tested two identical instruments, ident identical as possible, um, one that had been played every day for years and one that had sat for months, I would expect them to have the same acoustic properties. And a musician will tell me I'm crazy. And so uh, I decided, well, I must, I, I must test this, right? Um, it turns out that there are some luthiers, some, some makers of uh, stringed instruments, who when they make a new instrument, before they put it on the, the display shelf or before they, they, they send it out, they'll actually artificial, they'll try to artificially age it, not to be, um, you know, not, not, to, not to try to scam anyone, but to try to, to get it broken in. And they take their, their instrument, which is either partially constructed or mostly constructed, and they put it on something that's like a paint shaker. And they'll shake that instrument in a controlled way, but they'll shake that instrument to try to artificially get it broken in, and they'll shake it for a day or maybe over the weekend or, or for a week. And then it gets that broken in quality. And I thought, well, that's just nuts. That's just the, the looniest thing I ever heard. And so I had a student, and he actually constructed a, a, a mandolin. I don't, we picked a mandolin, whatever. Um, constructed a mandolin. The wood was brand new. We put it after the, um, after, after the uh, sound box was, was built. We put it on a, a lab shaker. We, uh, well, actually, we tested it first. Sorry. We tested it with our speckle pattern interferometer, and then we put it on the, on the lab shaker, shook it overnight, ran the exact same test, exact same conditions, and sure enough, we could measure, we had measurable differences in the resonances of the sound box. And I was blown away. And, and so, I mean, I learned from the musicians that there is something to that, and that's something that needs to be studied. So the varnish, um, and, and the, it turned out in our study, we didn't study varnish, but we did study uh, the effect of the glue joints. The glue joints uh, turned out not to be um, a contributor. We don't know about uh, the varnish. There are some other people that say that it really has very little to do with the varnish. But yeah. Well, I'd like to thank the speaker again.
If you have any other questions, uh, I think Dr. Morrison will stick around for a few minutes if you have another question you want to come down and talk to him.